Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, stay with us. You don't want to miss this. My special interview with the Pennsylvania Budget Secretary, Charles Zogby. We're going to talk about all things financial. And then Capital Wire's Pete DeCourcy will find out what the big story of the week is. Where in Harrisburg, maybe? We'll be back in a moment. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. I welcome back to the program. Well, let's, let's put it this way. The governor has introduced the budget, has a little more spending in it than last year, about 2.4% increase. The guy who knows all about budgets, Charles Zogby, he's in charge of... He's the budget guru. I called you that once before on this program, I think. Welcome to the program. Nice to be with you again, Terry. All right. Well, look, we're going to, before we get to the Pennsylvania budget, you've got to explain something to me. The sequester, as we tape this, is scheduled to happen. Now, two point, about 2.4 percent cut in the overall spending for this next fiscal year. Now, listen to this. In Pennsylvania, they're talking about 26.4 million in decrease in spending, primary and secondary ed, 360 teacher aid teachers and teacher age jobs going. Military, they're talking about thousands of jobs being closed at the Department of Defense. They're talking about public health. I can go through this list. How does a 2.4% cut in the budget well, it's result real. in all of w w this massive cuts to Pennsylvania's aid from the uh, federal government? Well, uh, and it's, it's also cuts after massive explosions of federal spending over the last many years. And the cuts are real, Terry. I mean, we ought to recognize that there will be, whether it's in education with Title I special education, there will be potentially less money coming from Pennsylvania, depending on how the president um, uh, and the, the executive branch uh, decides to enact these cuts. Uh, they do have some flexibility. And so it will be felt, whether it's a, a loss massive of teeth. Yeah. Well, uh, the cuts are real. The cuts, are, I don't think, are massive when you're talking about $85 billion in a, a, a huge uh, federal spending. Uh, but okay. how they play exactly play out at a local level, uh, that a district might receive less in Title I funds or less in special education funds, won't necessarily uh, directly lead to a teacher layoff. Those are going to be decisions that local mm -hmm. school boards, local administrators are going to have to make. And my sense is that they're going to try to uh, uh, have those cuts uh, impact with as yeah. least impact or harm sort to students as possible. To, I mean, you, look, you're, you, you deal with budgets, department, line items. It's sort of mindless way to do it, isn't it? It is uh, absolutely mindless. And I, I don't think uh, many people disagree that the federal government needs to rein in spending. We can't have budgets where we're spending a trillion dollars more every year. But a couple of things. One is that it is mindless and that it's across the board. You know, Governor Corbett has made some very tough decisions over the last couple of years, but he's made choices and, and uh, set priorities. We've, we've had a failure of that uh, in Washington. And I think the other uh, piece here is that it's really the explosion of entitlement spending. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the real problem that okay. confronts our federal government, not discretionary spending. And there just seems to be an unwillingness in Washington, particularly uh, out of the White House, to deal with uh, serious mm -hmm. entitlement reform. All right, let's talk about another big issue before the Commonwealth, which is Medicaid uh, spending. You know, since the Supreme Court decision dealing with the Affordable Care Act, governors have a, and legislatures have the opportunity to go ahead and increase uh, the coverage for uh, potential Medicaid recipients, maybe about 850,000 people in our state. Yes. All around us, everybody has done that, including Republican governors in Ohio and New, and New Jersey. Governor Corbett has not yet made a final decision. You're going to help me out here. In his budget address, I noticed that he didn't close the door completely. You all have questions you want answered from the federal government. Where, where, does the gov where do you all stand on Medicaid expansion? Well, the governor's taking a serious look at Medicaid and, and Medicaid expansion and whether it's something that Pennsylvania can afford, not just today, uh, but uh, uh, over the years. I mean, the go this governor in particular has been left with a lot of what I call legacy issues mm -hmm. because of the failure of past administrations, say, to address transportation or pensions. We now yeah, fi yeah, find ourselves okay. confronting crises in those areas. But now, I, we're going to run to a break, but here's my question to you. you. Have you made a final decision on that? The governor's not made a final decision. We're looking at how much it can cost and whether we can customize okay. this to Pennsylvania's need and, and do okay. it Pennsylvania's way, so not Washington's So the people way. are wrong when they say that he's done deal, not going to expand it, it's out of the question. 
Governor has never said uh, uh, declaratively okay. no on this. We're going, to run to, we're going to run to a break. Sorry to interrupt. When we come back, I'm going to talk to uh, the Budget Secretary about another big issue, liquor privatization. It's a huge issue. It's before the General Assembly. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation, educating citizens and business leaders about important public policy issues and civic affairs. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by BetterSaferRoads.com. To voice your support for safer highways and less traffic congestion, visit BetterSaferRoads.com. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Hi, welcome back to the program with Charles Zogby. He's the Budget Secretary of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're going through a laundry list of important issues that are before the legislature. The governor made recommendations about some of these at the budget message he delivered in February. All right, liquor control privatization. Third governor to try it, Thornburg, Governor Thornburg and Ridge. You guys are back at it again. I'm telling you, as I listen to what's going on in the legislature, doesn't seem to be a huge interest in this, even though the voters I've polled on it seem to have some interest and support for it. What do you think is going to happen here? Well, the, vo the voters obviously want change and they want more convenience. We have a, uh, an antiquated system. We have a system where really every one of our stores, if you take out the wholesale functions, is a profit-losing enterprise. Uh, we're also in a constrained budget era, and the governor wants to believes that we, uh, by privatizing the system, uh, both wholesale and retail functions, we could put an extra billion dollars into public education mm -hmm. in a time when our schools and our, and our teachers, our, um, our school districts need it. And so the governor thinks this is a good trade-off. I think there is uh, support in the General Assembly, but again, this is something that we're going to have to mm -hmm. work through in the next several months to achieve. Let, let me put it another way. There's some folks who say, well, what about a little hybrid here? You keep the same liquor control board operation, but you allow them to perform the same functions, you know, let them expand the licenses. You want to expand them by, I think, 600, go to 1,200 retail licenses. Let them do that and manage it and sort of create a hybrid. Now, I noticed, and I've listened to the governor a number of cases, full privatization, full privatization. He doesn't talk. Maybe that's a political, you know, I mean, a posturing to accept the are you open to a compromise on this? Well, I, I, I'll leave that to the governor to, uh, to speak to. I think the issue, though, Terry, is that the governor's looking to maximize revenues for public yeah. education. So there are, there are many thoughts and ideas uh, short of full privatization that, that folks have. The problem is, is that it doesn't yield the kind of revenues that we can make serious investments in our public schools. Yeah. And that's what the governor's committed to try to do. And so I think uh, he's, a, he is gonna get, he's definitely going to be pushing this through uh, several months and uh, we'll see where we end up but uh, he believes that this is a way that we can mm -hmm. and again in a constrained era take a billion dollars and invest it in our kids invest it in our public schools um, and that uh, core function of, of state government is public education it's not selling and, and marketing alcohol to people all right I'm going to run to a break and we come back I want to there's a couple of other subjects transportation funding it's a huge issue there's a consensus you know, you're, it's rare to get a consensus in a Pennsylvania legislature. There's a consensus Republicans and Democrats both agree that something has to be done about the funding on a very important issue that we've talked about many times on this program. We'll be back with the Budget Secretary after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Union, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program with Charles Zogby, the Budget Secretary for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're talking about all, all things budget. I want to chat now with the Budget Secretary about transportation. We've done a myriad of programs on this. Uh, 
governor's own commission, 2.5 billion a year is needed to fix roads and bridges, uh, and you know some consideration for mass transit. Uh, over, over in the legislature, you introduced a bill, or you, the governor came out and said, "We'll raise the oil franchise tax." We talked about that. Uh, Republicans in the legislature have said, uh-oh, we need a little more. Some have said maybe we'll raise license and registration fees. Uh, some want to get to the $2.5 billion a year. What, what's, what's your position of the administration on? You're going to get something on whether you can buy into increases or not. Well, I think, you know, the governor uh, has put out a proposal, and he's mindful that uh, oftentimes it's a starting point for the discussion. I think some of the factors, though, is that uh, before the governor's proposal, uh, we didn't have the, or the commission report, the TFAC report, we didn't have the public-private partnership bill that's now right. law, where we can bring in private companies to maybe do uh, bridge repair or bridge rehab. So we've got a number of other tools, modernization from PennDOT, a number of other tools that are in the box. The governor thinks that his proposal is sized uh, correctly. There's others that, that don't yeah. uh, agree with that. I think, you know, we'll be in search of the Goldilocks there, proposal there, there that's go. just right uh, over the coming Republican months. Republican and Democratic support. And you, and well, and, and it has to have House and Senate support that's as right. well. There's that's two right. chambers that may that's have a different view on this. So I, I think we'll has, work towards a, a compromise. The governor has to be willing to put his uh, John Hancock on the bottom line, right? That's exactly Well, yeah. let's talk about another aspect of that, that is, and it's been tried over the years. The feds have said no, and that's you know, about user fees when you toll, you know, if you use it, you should pay somewhat proportionate. So if you're out in the roads, any consideration of doing some more tolling? Well, I think the tolling aspect from a federal level, the feds, as I've understood right. from Secretary Shoke, have basically put up a stop sign that we can't toll in many areas. But I think the public-private partnership, for instance, there, you might have a, uh, a, a bridge uh, where you're able to uh, put tolls on a bridge that's uh, used and uh, generate enough revenue to not only do a major rehab or construction on, on that portion, but surrounding areas as well. So I think there is potentially an, a, a tolling element here. And I think from the governor's perspective, we're talking about uh, putting these uh, uh, on the people that are actually using the infrastructure. So it's not mm -hmm. the person uh, like the licensing fee who maybe isn't uh, riding the roads, but again, trying to make it more of a user-based uh, fee system as it is uh, in yeah. large part today. I think the bigger point you made, and then I'll let, I'll let you go, the bigger point is that it's a starting point and that you've not ruled out uh, working with the legislature on additional ways to... Uh, raise revenue. We correct? do that on all of our initiatives, uh, 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 Terry. As you know, it's a process of give and take, and I fully expect right. over the course of the spring that we're going to have those those sorts of discussions there, with the general. The assembly. producer's in my ear. He says we got another minute or so. Pensions, forty-one. I can't figure out whether it's forty-one or forty-four billion dollars. Forty-one in, billion dollars. Uh, unfunded I've been liability. Forty-four billion as unfunded liability, but forty-one is what I've been using as well. You, you want to go to a 401k for new employees. Again, in the legislature, there seems to be some reluctance to go very far with that. What, what, g give us your position. Well, the problem is, Terry, is that these our pension uh, payments are rising rapidly. The year-over-year -year payments right. are over a half a billion dollars. They're taking 60% plus of all new revenue into the Commonwealth, and they're really squeezing the general fund. Funding for education, human services is under pressure because we've got these enormous pension payments that we have to make. And we're not talking about putting less into our pension systems. We're going to put in more this year, but we're talking about a little less and paying for that through reforms uh, for future employees as well as current employees. Um, and the idea is, is that we're going to preserve all of the benefits of current retirees, all of the benefits that current employees have earned to date, but we're talking about a slightly uh, different deal going forward with the impact largely in the out years on those who would have the most state or public school district service. Um, and it's a way to rebalance our obligations between our pension costs and our general fund. We can't cut core services and programs to people uh, to basically pay for public employee pensions. And that's what's happening right now. All the taxpayers are going to be forced to contribute more mm -hmm. so that, that public mm -hmm. school employees and state workers okay. get a better retirement deal than they have right now in the private sector. All right, well, look, I want to thank you. Maybe I know June won't be a great time to get you on this program, but we're going to try because that's probably when they're be going happy to be, to come be back. in the midst of having the debate over all of these things. All right, Pete DeCourcy is next. We're going to find out what the big story of the week is in the state capitol following these words. 
This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, sitting across from me is not Pete DeCourcy, as you will see in a moment. We're going to keep the budget secretary on. There are three or four other important issues I want to talk about with him. Pete will be on on another show. Mr. Secretary, thanks for staying on. Happy to. Stay. All right, I want to continue. I wasn't finished with this pension in inquiry stuff. I mean, there's, there's lots of debate about how to do it. The critics say that you go to a 401k, it really doesn't solve anything. It just pushes the debt down the road. What's your response to that? As you know, you've read that criticism in a bunch of papers. Well, you know, Go ahead. I think there's a couple things. One is that um, the overwhelming uh, retirement package of choice in the private sector is a 401k. So I think we have to confront the fact that we right now have uh, state and school district employees that have uh, a better retirement deal than the taxpayers who uh, have to support them. That's one thing. I think the biggest thing with a 401k, uh, uh, though, is that it takes the liability off of the Commonwealth and the taxpayers. You started the question with a $41 billion liability in the last segment. Uh, that has grown because we've had uh, past governors, General Assembly, provide benefits that weren't paid for, uh, or simply underfund the pension systems because they had the ability to do that. You take that away with a 401k. So what we're talking about here is really uh, not something that this, go this governor will immediately enjoy, but uh, future generations of taxpayers won't be saddled with the prospect of billions of dollars in debt uh, because we've been able because uh, games were played with our pension system. And I think that's a, a huge thing to, uh, to remove from taxpayers that future liability for future pen pension benefits, I think, is a does, huge part of the relief. Yeah, does it work fiscally if you have <clears throat> less, if you have fewer employees that are in the system that you're still going to have to pay full benefits for, but you're not getting the contribution from the employee as well as the employer to cover? I mean, I always thought the assumption was that you got to keep adding employees <laughs> you know, and have, go ahead. Well, and what we'll do is we'll, so as the, the state or school districts as an employer, we'll make a payment to the pay for the benefits, the normal cost, right. as they say, of active employees. Uh, they'll pay, uh, and the state will pay a cost for the, the defined contribution, the 401k plan. And then over that total salary base, we'll make contributions mm -hmm. uh, based on the unfunded liability. So we're going to pay our debt down over time, just as uh, uh, taxpayers' families do with a mortgage. You don't pay a mortgage all at once, or at least most people don't. They pay it over 30 years, and that's what we'll do with our unfunded liability. How, how much uh, credibility do you give to the criticism that in past administrations, and this would apply, I think, to both Democratic and Republican yes. administrations, there was no employer contribution rate into the system for I think four years, you'll correct me, for four years or so as a, in addition to the market crash, you know, which obviously led to less investment, uh, uh, pro, you know, uh, revenues coming yes. from the investment side, which of those two are they both responsible, do you think, for this $41 billion deficit? Well, they, they each play a role. I think the market returns plays the largest role because 70% of our, our earnings are based on market mm -hmm. returns. And when you have, as we did with the Great Recession and, and uh, uh, a big downturn in the market, that affects uh, revenues uh, or, or the growth of the investments. But it's also the case, too. Governor Rendell, for instance, um, uh, underfunded pensions by nearly six billion dollars starting in 2004 that had and then that money was spent elsewhere um, and so the to shortchange the pension funds by that amount that clearly played a role uh, in the 41 billion dollar unfunded liability today and you also had other governors that gave for instance colas cost of living increases uh, that were unpaid for. The last one was done in, I think, 2002. Right. $1.7 billion, $5 billion uh, that had no funding source. So all of these things together contributed to the problem. 
the 401k stops that from ever occurring again. And then what the governor has said is that we've got to look at the future benefits of current employees and just trimming somewhat the growth in those benefits, guaranteeing everybody what they've already earned, but a little less going forward, uh, not only to avoid deep cuts in the general fund and core services and programs that the rest of Pennsylvania enjoys, um, but also to ensure that we can pay the current benefits because the track that we're on now is unsustainable. All right, just for the, the record, we did have Michael Crossy from PSEA on. We, you know, the Pennsylvania State Education Association. We get all, uh, we we strive to get a variety of points of view on this program. I want to let, let's spend a minute on the overall budget process. The hearings are underway. Uh, do you expect the legislature? I mean, some tweaks here and there. I don't get any sense that we're looking at a major deviation from what the governor recommended. Is that your sense as you've been following these hearings? I think so, and I think if you look back, Terry, Democrat or Republican governors do a pretty good job of getting uh, most of what they want in their budgets. Um, and I think uh, I've not seen at least a lot of criticism about the, the plan the core, that this governor has budget. put forward, the core budget proposal. But beyond that, the governor wants to achieve, uh, we've talked about liquor store privatization, the host sale retail functions. He wants to put another billion dollars mm -hmm. into public education. Uh, we need pension reform to balance this budget. We've got $175 million in savings. That's going to have to be made up with cuts elsewhere if we don't get pension reform. And we need to make progress on modernizing our transportation yeah. infrastructure. So yeah. all of those, those big three are, are the core uh, uh, governor's goals in addition to a balanced budget on time. We have about a minute, Ten. One of the things that I've read recently has to do with these escalating prison costs, which I think you're trying to get a handle on. And the number of folks in prisons, you're closed two prisons or you're closing two prisons. Where, where, what's the general position of, of, your, of the Corbett administration on these prison costs and how you're trying to bring them into line? Well, we have tried. I mean, uh, last year we held the Department of Corrections budget uh, level funded uh, for the first time in over a decade. We had about a $60 million increase this year in, in large part of bringing a new prison online. We, but we've seen the first... Uh, the governor's justice reinvestment initiative where we're we're talking about being smart on on crime and how we deal with uh, public safety that's projected to save over 130 million dollars uh, over the next many years that we're going to in part reinvest uh, we just right-sized our uh, youth de development centers and the department of public welfare that's okay. going to be saving nearly 13 million 10 of which we're going to reinvest in the juvenile program you get the last word on this again thanks for coming on thank you terry all right we'll see you next week for another edition of pennsylvania newsmakers and as always stay well <laughs>